Of course, one thing we've got to bear in mind, and this session is about how we leverage off the experiences of Spain, but particularly Italy, is that in many countries, it would be unusual, if not unique, to have a law which tells doctors what to prescribe. I mean, it is, it's fascinating that in Italy this is possible. I can't imagine going to Denmark and going to a doctor there and saying, the law tells you that this is how you have to treat your patients. Uh, Gostino, do you think this is something that, it, that could apply right across Europe? Well, I think so, and uh, I hope so, because uh, I think this is a shock for the healthcare system. And um, uh, I'm sorry that yesterday Professor Fanelli was, uh, had the short time to say all the story, because this law is not, uh, uh, was not born uh, just uh, by chance. Yes. We have been working for many, many years. The commission that was uh, uh, organized by Marco Pizzichino was going on for uh, more than 10 years. And finally, we had the chance, the good chance, to have a minister that was a doctor and uh, who had the very peculiar sensitivity to the topic. And that was the reason why we got, at the end, a law that was unanimously voted in the parliament, both in the, the parliament and in the Senate. And this was a big success. But going back to your question, I think uh, this should apply also, and in my opinion, it should also come some uh, indication, specific indication from the European Parliament. Because if we recognize that chronic pain is a very important topic, we must do something also, as uh, uh, Professor Wells has said before, from the, the legal point of view. Paloma, how easy was it to get a, a law in, in Spain, particularly in Andalusia, uh, were doctors accepting that the, the politicians would tell them how to treat their patients? Um, in our country, it's not, it's, it's not so easy to have a law. Uh, because uh, let me explain to you that we have a decentralized country. We don't have, um, we have, we really have only one national health system, about um, almost uh, 20. I'm sorry, uh, 17 different regional health services. So each services is autonomous to develop strategies. So um, the aim of the ministry is to, um, uh, to mark uh, the way they have to follow. Um, and we do that through strategies on health, not only with laws, general laws, because every country, every region has its own parliament and can uh, develop some um, regional laws. Um, the most important thing, um, we think, is to reach the consensus between all the regions, uh, to follow the lines, uh, common lines uh, to deal with uh, pain, for example. So we deal with uh, some uh, health, uh, main health problems uh, through developing um, strategies on health. Strategies on health um, are set by the consensus of other regions and also uh, taking into account um, um, scientific societies, experts, and um, most important, uh, taking into account patients. We, take, um, we, we took patients to work together with all the stakeholders, patient associations. So then we have developed a cancer strategy, palliative care strategy, especially dedicated to children. For example, uh, this year we've de developed um, and especially issue to palliative care on children with rheumatic and musculoskeletal diseases, strategy, etc., rare diseases, for example. So the main point is to, to achieve the consensus, because if you achieve this consensus through the um, Interterritorial Council, uh, you have the commitment of every region to develop um, the main uh, strategic lines and the goals you've set it uh, in these uh, strategies and those uh, recommendations that we've set it. So it's not only by the law, but by the um, here in Spain, by the consensus among that's the regions. I mean, that's quite important because I think the majority of countries in Europe would probably be more like the Spanish model, where it would be difficult to do things just by straight legislation. Uh, look, Rolf Detlef, from my point of view, I wish we could just pass a law 
like in Italy, bam, that's it. You have to abide by it. But realistically, I don't think that's going to happen across Europe, is it? What do you think? Yeah, I'm surely with you. I don't think it's going to happen easily because the healthcare systems are different. Um, so I think there are two messages in there. Number one, each country should try to do what they can. For example, in Germany, the teaching content of medical schools is governed by a nationwide law. So two years ago, we passed a law that pain medicine teaching is mandatory. So about, I think, next year, the first people who graduate, where everybody in Germany has had some minimal teaching on this. So it just happened to be governed by a nationwide law. But in terms of doctor's prescriptions, there are no laws on that. But that, that was a Bundestag law, was it? That was a, yeah, it a was, central government it's, law. It's, it's not a law, it's, it's uh, one uh, level less, but it's a joint sure. federal and uh, statewide and was, law. Did you have to achieve a consensus first, or do you have a, somebody like Dr. Spitzakino? Like in Italy, it report? was a 10-year process to get it done. The other aspect, I think, is at the European level, we could try to give a little bit of push to these projects by instituting this network for monitoring purposes that seems to be part of the Italian uh, law of uh, 2010, and that I could conceive might work if the European Commission would create such a monitoring body that would then create official reports on progress across Europe. So the ZIP initiative has tried to do this with the help of the nonprofit organizations. Um, and we have two versions of the document already, but it doesn't have a government status. So I think this is for the European Union. Mm -hmm. So each country should use the opportunities that they have. And there are some aspects that I think should be done at the EU level. But, um, how much do you think the EU could influence all the 27 member states? Well, I, I think it, it's a, a great opportunity that uh, a presidency of the uh, EU is promoting access to, to uh, pain management, including to uh, controlled medicines, and giving a good example by uh, having this law. Uh, with the word show, uh, I uh, initiated the Atoma project with uh, uh, 10 uh, organizations together aiming at 12 Eastern European countries. And we are in the last month of that and uh, drafting the uh, report, which will be on the internet uh, in maybe two weeks' time. Uh, and uh, we, we analyze the legislation and we analyze the policies in the countries together with people from the ministries and with uh, people from the healthcare. And uh, there we found, uh, you, you just said a moment ago, it's unique that a law prescribes doctors what to do, but actually it's not unique, but it's unique that it's prescribing in a positive way. Because we found so many legal barriers in Eastern Europe where there is a limit on the dosage sometimes, a limit on the number of days for which a doctor can prescribe, a limit for the validity uh, of the prescription. Is this, is this Forgive me, is this just for opioids or for a whole no, range it, of No, it's for oh, uncontrolled medicines. We, we have a century of uh, drug control. Now, the first uh, opium treaty was signed in 1912. And the world has been focusing on uh, containing a drug problem and forgot totally that these substances are also used as medicines. So we don't have a treatment of pain, we don't have treatment of opioid dependence, which goes also with controlled substances like methadone. And for some other diseases, it's also hard to get access. So we need to change the paradigm from uh, that public health is served only by uh, minimizing the uh, use of controlled substances into we need to find the optimum between making it accessible for patients who uh, need them and who can use them rationally, and uh, people who are harming themselves by using these substances. And then manage and find the optimum. And uh, what, what we fortunately found is that many rules that uh, are in countries and that are uh, impeding access to controlled medicines, they uh, actually don't do anything for prevention of drug misuse. So, uh, a, a rule of, of only uh, the validity of, of seven days or saying you, you're not allowed to prescribe more than 75 milligrams of morphine a day, 
uh, it doesn't work to prevent the misuse of heroin. But many countries in the world have rules like this. Uh, the other issue, of course, is that um, Italy's presidency is coming to an end at the end of the year. Uh, is it Latvia? I think it's Latvia taking over. So if we are going to get leverage from this initiative, we have to do so, presumably very, very quickly. Yeah, I hope so. And uh, I wish that uh, this uh, initiative will uh, uh, seed something around Europe and to have some other uh, uh, different view than the pessimistic ones yeah. we had till now. Because actually, I completely agree with Robert that uh, uh, the, the doctors should claim for their uh, uh, freedom. But uh, this law is just giving rules, general rules. It's not prescribing absolutely what to do and how to do it. It's not uh, something that you can discuss, Robert, to ask doctors, please, when a patient comes into the emergency, please measure his or her pain. This is something that has nothing to do with the obligation. Every day. Uh, uh, yes. Every day. Yeah. Like you measure the fever, like you measure the blood pressure, etc. This has nothing to do with obligation. This is something that is absolutely necessary, Nick, to change the culture. Robert, the same problem, I'm sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you again, but the same problem we experienced with uh, the prescription of opioids. We obtained in 2002 a complete freedom for doctors to prescribe opioids. Of course, following certain rules. That has not changed the attitude of doctors in prescription, of course. Because going back to the, the topic of this morning, early this morning, this is a cultural problem, it's not an educational problem. Because doctors are educated to use opioids, but the culture needs time to change. It's, it's not just a problem of different countries. This is a problem, as we were saying earlier, of different institutions and of different people working within those institutions. Robert, you will know in the United Kingdom, where we have quite a relatively high use of, of opioids, I was describing earlier how ambulance, particularly London ambulance service, will not regard pain as a triage issue at all. Sometimes you can go to accident and emergency centres, they don't regard pain as an issue at all. And yet, in that same institution, a patient may be taken admitted onto a ward, and routinely a nurse will come round later in the evening and say, do you need any pain relief? She won't measure it, but it's, it's all very haphazard. Now, if we're not going to have a law accepted in all the countries across Europe, what can we do to get rid of this haphazard approach? I think one of the things is, uh, as we were talking this morning, is as you begin to form alliances next year, which I think is what you said you were going to do, um, to raise the expectation amongst the patient community of what they should be getting. You know, um, there's, there's very much a, a sort of reaction to the patients becoming th their own expert. Um, and there's a little concern about what this might mean, but, but used in the proper way, elevating the patient expectation to a level where we, we know this is what should happen when we go into hospital makes it much easier for the patient to ask. You know, you don't have to demand. You can ask politely to start with and then just raise the expectation and push the boundaries until, you know, the consumer, the health consumer, can help standardise at a high level of treatment. Rob, that left. I think the topic of the fifth vital sign, in some countries it can be uh, solved by a law, like in Portugal and France also. In, in other places, I think there are other approaches. So if you make sure that the suppliers of hospital charts have it on there, and make sure that the nurses get trained that it's one of the five signs, then you will have it. There's one more decisive point, though, that we haven't talked about. I think this is, again, political. We need this to be considered a quality indicator for hospital performance. So that's... Not so easy. There you're back to laws and uh, regional regulations. But you raise such a simple issue. If it was there on the charts, along with pulse, respiration, temperature, it'd be as simple as that. As I'm going past the bed, I'm bound to, to show how I... But then, 
how good is, is the measurement? How, how well calibrated have we got a way of measuring pain? Because that is one of the problems, isn't it? It seemed to be subjective. So, well, I, I can speak to that. So, um, of course, as a subjective measure, it's not absolutely calibrated like a high-precision temperature measurement device for taking uh, the body temperature. But uh, by and large, people can use it. And we teach this to our students all the time. They, they get into the lab course and they think it's impossible, and then we have them apply some stimuli and, and rate them, and it's doable. And the interesting thing is that there seems to be a magic number, about one-third up the scale, that people without pain think if it goes above this, they would be unhappy, and people who have chronic pain, if it goes below this, they are less unhappy than they, and they could live with it. So, in spite of all the technical problems that we have with these scales, 0 to 10, 0 to 100, it, it's meaningful if you don't take the last digit too literally. Yes, yeah. I, I suppose, actually, an awful lot of tests that we use are subjective. If you go to an ophthalmologist and she asks you to say how far you can read down the, the E, A, B, L, whatever it is, and I suppose that's subjective in a way, isn't it? Uh, we, we're trying to get metrics for things which actually are about perceptions or in, in a whole range of things. Let's open this up, please. Uh, I, oh, sorry, did you want to come in, Plumy? Yeah. Uh, because um, I would like to explain to you that one uh, key point of our um, uh, way to deal with uh, pain was a um, 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 framework document that includes especially uh, measure the measure the um, evaluation of pain and um, in a holistic uh, way of a human being so you have not to mm, not to measure only with the scales but to answer a patient how do we um, how does he feels about pain how does pain uh, um, impacts on his life and, and on his um, daily activities um, and at the end, uh, making a, a non -a, not, not only a biological uh, scale, but a um, um, psychological and a social evaluation. And that's why we try to, um, to, to show, um, uh, not only nurses, nurses but uh, students, but um, undergraduate, um, on undergraduate um, um, programs and postgraduate programs, the, the evaluation of pain, the measure of pain, is not only a number, it's a holistic um, concept. And this is put on our document and with an especially um, it's a main uh, key point. How, how important is coding? You know, for, for a lot of uh, things, if you want medical treatment, particularly if you've got uh, private health insurance, but uh, coding is very important. It, there is coding for pain. I think coding is very important to get things reimbursed from your insurance. It is, yeah. it is, but it can be a very useful way of getting pain higher on the agenda too because there is something concrete when it has a code. And I'm trying to find ways of moving away from this subjectivity. It doesn't really matter, it's just in the mind. If it's got a code, it's real. And actually, HMOs, health maintenance organisations, national organisations like Britain's National Health Service, private insurers, everybody relates to a code. Ralph Uh You may know that in Germany, if it doesn't have a code, you don't get reimbursed. So we rely very strongly on codes. And uh, the problem with pain codes is that they are uh, diluted across the entire spectrum of ICD. And uh, the coding criteria are not very precise. So this need had been detected in, in uh, around 2005 or 2006, and the German Pain Society and some psychiatric, psychosomatic societies sat together and came up with a definition for the most important uh, patient population, those who have somatic factors and psychological factors and who need a treatment for both. Mm -hmm. So they published a nice definition and then it took us a little bit of a lo lobbying effort to get this into the German modification of ICD-10. And we introduced this in 2009. And immediately in that very year, this became the primary indication for multimodal pain therapy in Germany. That had other indications that were sometimes questioned. So now we had a combination of a code and a treatment. 
And then in 2013, uh, this was introduced in what's called Morbi RSA, which is the shifting of funds between the different insurance uh, companies according to the morbidity load that they had. When this system was introduced, everybody in the pain field thought that back pain must be on there, but in the first version it was not, because it was diluted here and there. But then this code was a crystallization point where I, was, I think it was three or four diagnoses identified a group of patients, the chronic back pain patients, that are expensive to treat, and that was an immediate effect that took four years to come from a coding. And now with another change in legislation, we're getting to integrative treatment programs that then I assume the health uh, care industry is willing to pay. So codes play a role. And one interesting thing I learned just this weekend, uh, although WHO is working on an ICD-11, it doesn't mean that ICD-10 is dead. Um, there's a major revision for ICD-10 planned for 2016, and they're pretty sure that they will have another one in 2019. So there is a code in, in Germany that one could maybe use as a model. And if you're interested, it's the only code I know. It's F4541. <laughs> Sounds like a fighter plane, sorry. <laughs> F4541 seems to be something that should be engraved yes. on our hearts, actually, <laughs> over the next year. Because there is quite a lot of evidence that what gets coded gets paid for uh, and gets done. And if you have to code something, it's a bit like the check at the end of the bed, the checklist. Yeah. Um, you, you've actually got to, got to fill it in. Please, contributions from, from the floor. Yes, please, right at the back there. And again, could those with the microphones not wait for me? If you see someone with their hand up, Please, let's get a microphone to them as quickly as we can. So if you've got a microphone, just, just speak up. Is there somebody there, have you got one? <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to, uh, if I understood well today, I would like to summarize all this, uh, what we are talking about. Pain is uh, in all the uh, in all the books that where we study pain is known to be mute. So I think that it's about patients that uh, experience pain, but they don't want to disturb. They don't want to. They feel a little bit ashamed to have pain. They don't want to be heavy, to be burden on others, and they I think remain mute. They are not able to shout loud. They are not able to bite hard. Uh, they stay there. Uh, maybe for this, uh, we in Italy <laughs> have a law that protects those patients. And I think that the next step, when we think about next year, might be to show that, uh, that these patients uh, actually exist. Do we have a, a registry that says how many are those that are suffering from chronic back pain? If we have a registry that says the number, it's not approximately, but the number is, maybe we can have an appeal on politicians to make structural changes, because we know that structural changes can change behavior, can change even uh, the way to, to, to continue, uh, change mechanisms, and maybe affect on other sections, <laughs> other parts of how to manage this problem. Thank you. Uh, and incidentally, you making a a point to me earlier during, during the break, that you as an anaesthetist or anaesthesiologist, anaesthesiologist, what was I can't remember, what, what's, how does the American say it? Anaesthetist. Yeah, I call it anaesthetist, uh, whatever. Uh, that you work in an operating theatre and that all the stuff that you do beyond that is basically in your own time. And that's an, a real issue that we've got, that a lot of pain specialists are expected as, as, as anaesthetists to really be giving people anaesthetics. Uh, during surgery, and they're, they're often finding it uh, difficult to find the time to do other things. But just make the, picking up this point about stigma, has anybody got any thoughts on how we, how we resolve this? It's about um, uh, the patient, the, 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 um, our way to, to develop strategies includes um, patients, always includes patients. We do have patients in the develop our, our, of our um, strategies on health. And they have the same voice that uh, scientific associations. 
So the difficulty of that is uh, to reach the consensus again yes. um, between and to put together all the stakeholders. But we do have patients, and this is, um, I, I think, is a treasure that we have in our strategies. For example, in pain, we deal with pain with, a, uh, with a, um, something like a strategy um, that includes the empowerment of patient. There is not only to inform and to form uh, to, uh, educational, uh, with educational programs with patients, it's to achieve the empower to patient to be um, able uh, to, um, to share decisions with physicians. So we do have patience, and it's very, very valuable. I, I, your idea of consensus, I just want to raise that a bit, Robert. Uh, it's all very well getting patients uh, involved, and, and there's a lot they can do to help each other, and there's a lot they can do to raise awareness. It's all very good to try and get politicians involved and policymakers involved, all very well trying to get uh, clinicians to be better trained and, and do more. Actually, this word consensus is really rather important. As we campaign, as we're going to, I think, try and do over the next year in a specifically targeted way, it's important to build consensus. And when we do that, we have to think like entrepreneurs, like, like business people, like politicians trying to achieve a diplomatic coup. We have to think, who needs to be brought into that consensus? Where? Where's their power? Does it matter if we don't include these people? I don't know that anybody's doing this at the moment, are they? I mean, SIP is obviously an attempt to cr create an alliance, mm -hmm. but it's not really an attempt to get a consensus across Europe. Well, I, I think certainly the European Patients Forum is doing that. Right. And, and many of you here perhaps will be, your member organization will be a member of European Patients Forum. And, and really, over about 10, 15 years, that organization has grown tremendously, both in terms of capacity and influence. And, uh, you know, it's reached the situation where, you know, the new health commissioner comes in, and one of the first things he do is, does is meet the president of the European Patients Forum. Because, you know, this is recognized as a, a very key area. And... Um, so, I mean, I would strongly recommend that for this campaign, you, as much as possible, identify with the established organizations that already have influence. And as you say, that's what it's about. It's about building alliances, identifying where, you know, where you need allies, uh, where you can minimize your friends, um, where you want to use the media. And, and I'm fascinated, Nick, that you keep saying we. I'm pleased to conclude from that that you're going to be participating in this for the next year or two. I hope that's the case. Um, and, 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 and I would congratulate you for bringing you know, this and working with these, this group of people and making the whole message so meaningful, because I, I've never really heard it put in such a concise way before. Well, actually, I, I just come back to the fact that... <laughs> Thank you very much. But I, I want to come back to the, the fact that time is precious on this. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have the presidency, which is, is about to, to pass on. We have, of course, um, is it Mr. Andrew Kaitis? I'm trying to remember his name, the new health commissioner. A Andrew Kaitis, something like... He's the, uh, the Lithuanian, Lithuanian, who's now the health minister of, of Europe. And he's really good, and he's really good at this. Now, he's not going to be there forever either. Uh, so, and he's a physician. And he understands these things. So actually, doors are ajar. They are not locked against us anymore. We have this opportunity now. And it does mean that we've really got to get some, some speed. Mm -hmm. Please, uh, does anybody else want to contribute to this? Yes, can we get a, a microphone over there, please? Yes, Louise Skelly uh, from the Patient and Client Council in Northern Ireland. Um, last year, we uh, worked with a group and we produced a report called The Painful Truth, which was 2,500 patient stories. And there's a lot of talk here about the patient voice, and I think that's going to be one of the key things that will bring about change. That certainly helped to bring a change in attitude, um, at least to an extent in Northern Ireland. We have a long way to go yet. One of the things that concerns me a wee bit about the discussion has been a lot of discussions about alliances and about grouping in with other conditions. And because chronic pain is not as far on in many regards as other conditions, we would be a wee bit concerned about that in Northern Ireland because that is one of the things the CMO has actually suggested that we do, that we become part of the long-term condition strategy. In actual fact, a lot of other long-term conditions are much more developed 
and we would have liked to have seen something very specific around chronic pain and we're still campaigning for that and having lost sight of that. So while there are um, many advantages to being part of other strategies, you have to think of where your starting line is and where your baseline is. It's just I think it's a very good point. Uh, very, forgive me, I think it's a very good point. We are concerned with pain. Now, we're not saying that other things are unimportant. We're not saying we want to halt cancer research or something else because we're looking at pain. But nor do we want to throw in our lot with a generalised campaign on behalf of patients, a generalised campaign on behalf of medical research, a generalised campaign on, on any other issue. We've really got to stay focused in this, haven't we? And it's, a, it's an important warning that. It may sound a bit selfish to some of these broader alliances, but I... I it does occur to me, I don't know if you all agree, that there is a danger of just getting this diluted too far. In, Robert? I mean, that, that, that is a potential problem, but um, almost every organisation, um, when they think about joining the European Patient Forum or IARPO, the global organisation, will think, are we going to gain or lose by joining this broader coalition? And certainly both those coalitions I have seen work in a way that where, where there is a shared interest, we lobby together, but when it's relating to a specific issue, for instance, pain, we pass the baton over to the people who are the experts. As long as they are a genuine patient-led organisation, then, you know, then we, we would actually pass over to them on those specific issues. That seems to make great sense. Yes, please. Uh, Steve Gilbert from Scotland. I would just say that um, I would disagree with you, Nick, there, that uh, um, there are, are chronic conditions, which uh, long-term conditions, where... People have multiple morbid comorbidities. So a paper in The Lancet from Scotland last year was looking at uh, pain as being a common part of all sorts of long-term conditions, uh, peripheral vascular disease, COPD, uh, arthritis, obviously, neurological conditions. So chronic pain has much more in common with other long-term conditions than it has differences. And self-management is the same uh, for all of these different conditions. I think that if we're able to Get, it, get together with long-term conditions in general, which we have with uh, the Alliance in Scotland, that would be a very valuable approach. But does, does, while you've still got the microphone, does that not fit with what Robert was saying? Yes, though, that, that, there, that yeah. Where we make alliances, where pain can be made a major issue, yeah. we do. Uh -huh. Otherwise, we work on our own. But I wonder if there isn't almost um, not only an irrational, de uh, an irrational dependence by clinicians on drug therapy but also an irrational fear of using drugs as well. For them. Yeah. Uh, people often think that uh, if you use uh, opioid analgesics for pain, that you will uh, have a, high, a very high risk that you will become dependent. But actually, when you look at the literature, you don't find the evidence for that. Uh, th there is a study uh, that's a meta-analysis of 115 studies uh, on patients who were treated uh, with opioids for chronic non-cancer pain uh, for at least six months. And uh, w one of the things they found is that it was only 1% out of 2042 who became dependent. And there were three patients out of 684 uh, that be uh, were uh, misusing the substances. So the risk is very low. And uh, in WHO, I worked with a professor from Tokyo uh, who was one of the experts in an expert panel. And with his team, he did research with mice uh, where he found that mice in pain react differently from mice who are not in pain when you give them opioids. And uh, he, he has some uh, neurological theory that I don't understand, but that explains why, uh, why this difference. Uh, and uh, so we, we should not fear too much of becoming dependent. And then I, I'm not even talking about uh, terminally ill cancer patients who say, no, I don't want opioids because I'm, uh, I, I will become dependent. It, it, it just the average population. And our, our, we, we are all very biased by thinking of people who are uh, regular heroin users uh, Th that, that's our image of people who become dependent. And then we see these people and we revert our, uh, uh, unconsciously our way of reasoning and we say, so everybody who uses heroin is dependent. No. Uh, 
so everybody is very biased in, in, in this aspect. I, I detect somebody here is very anti-opioids, is that right? Okay, have you got the microphone still? to make an agreement with the patient about what you're expecting to achieve with opiates yeah. and um, the, the, the old thinking that we have to go up and up with the dose, there's no top dose of opiates is being found to not be accurate uh, in palliative care as well as in uh, non-malignant pain um, I think the, the incidence of, from a, a recent review that I looked at the incidence of, uh, of people developing a drug dependency problem was between 5 and 23 percent in, in different studies. So it's, it's, it's yeah, maybe a little bit higher than we thought yeah, it was there, before. There's another study uh, by uh, Cochrane uh, Collaborating yeah. Center in Rome that evaluated all these evidence. And, yeah. But there's studies that are very badly right. defining uh, what, what is uh, becoming dependent, yeah. what is misusing. And even patients coming uh, two weeks early for the medicines in the week before Christmas, mm -hmm. they are showing aberrant yeah. behaviors, and then they count in these percentages. But the Cochrane yeah. study that uh, was uh, done by uh, in, in Rome, they, they found, they I, I noted it down, uh, they said available evidence suggests that opioid analgesics for chronic pain conditions are not associated with the major risk for developing dependence. Yeah. This but is and and it, it is, of course, <laughs> a matter of... Uh, accurately prescribing. If doctors are prescribing a double dosage of what the patient needs, then you're asking for trouble because half of that, uh, that amount will go somewhere yeah. and can be misused. And, but even then, uh, if I would want to take opioids for fun, I rather would take, like to take prescription opioids than heroin because then I have a pharmaceutical quality. Yeah. So the risk for public health is much lower when people are taking uh, prescription opioids, which is not as exactly the same as prescribed opioids. They were intended for prescribing, and often they are coming from uh, crime. Uh, and it, it's much better than having the heroin, where you never know if there's fentanyl in it or that there's a glass powder in it to, to make the volume more.